we were talking about justification by faith. And Ellen White said, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. And if you're like me, it's easy sometimes. And I guess maybe when I was younger, that was more easy. But it's easy to just read stuff and kind of get up after reading a page and you walk away and you don't really grasp anything that you read. Has anybody ever had that happen? You know, so it's like, <clears throat> I don't like to do it in my, in my Ellen White books, but I'm getting to the point where I'm just like, you know, it's all going to burn. I'm highlighting stuff. It's like, I need to understand this. You know, that book that I had gotten years ago called Lessons on Faith by Jones and Wagner, which was right around the 1888 period. Um, it's not the newer one. There's a newer one that two ladies had, uh, had taken some other articles and put together, but the original one. I encourage everybody, purchase a copy of it. If you don't want to purchase it, email me and I'll give you a PDF. Um, I mean, you can read it on your computer or on your phone. Um, but if you purchase it, it's much easier because you can mark it up and you can write notes and references. Um, we have to grasp this. It's laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for us that which it is not in our power to do for ourselves. And I look at that and I think, you know, and I'm going to pick on our church denomination for a minute. Ellen White said we are repeating the history of the Jewish nation. Specifically, Seventh-day Adventists are. At the time that Jesus came here as a man, they had a form, but not the power. Read Nicodemus, uh, John chapter 3, about Nicodemus. First three or four verses, Nicodemus is like, we know you're from God. He was talking about the Sanhedrin. He said, because no man can do the things that we see you doing except God be with him. And the word with there is also in. So Nicodemus was like this. He was like, I am. He was like, look, I'm, I'm keeping the Sabbath. I'm eating kosher. My wife's skirts long enough. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm dotting my I's and crossing my T's, but something's not right. Something is missing. And for me, I'm that way. I, I'm, I'm not craving signs and wonders, but at the same time, God promised them. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 20, Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name you will cast out devils. You will lay hands on the sick, and they shall be healed. And he went through a number of other things. That was the great commission that Mark wrote. Matthew just says, Go proclaim these glad tidings. He that's baptized, who that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I want what Nicodemus was, was looking for. I want for us to be able to go into the hospital in Greenville or the hospital in Knoxville or the hospital in Asheville and heal everybody in there. And at least 80% of them show up at church next week. Do you understand? Because the gospel has to become real. It is laying the glory of man in the dust. We need that in our own lives. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Jesus was the word that was made flesh, right? What word was it that was made flesh? What word? God's word. Which one? Amen. Do you know, it's funny. God made a promise in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. I think it's chapter 30. He said, I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, your children to love me with all their hearts, their souls, their minds, and their strength. And people go, man, I, you know, I need that. God made that promise. What do I have to do to get that promise? Go to Colossians chapter 2. It says, in Christ we have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, 
by the circumcision of Christ. Every promise that God made in the Old Testament is in Christ Jesus, yea, and in him, amen. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Christ is the word of God that was made flesh. He that hath the Son hath life. So I've got to say, Lord, I need to surrender everything. My feelings when somebody cuts me off. My feelings when, when somebody is, is giving me sign language out the window with one hand. My feelings when things don't go right at home. My feelings when I've got to give you everything and ask you to come in and take possession of my heart. And you have to forgive me. I, I, I thought I had it on the slides, but I didn't include this one. Ellen White says, when the soul yields their will to Christ, he immediately comes in and takes possession of that person. He takes possession. That's the same way that an evil spirit takes possession. It's literal. It's not figurative. Through the Spirit of God, he wants to live literally inside of us just like he did in Jesus. Now look at this. The thought that the righteousness of Christ, the perfection, the obedience, the health, the strength, the faith, the compassion, it's all of it. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And we read, we read a quote from Ellen White where she said, imparted. The righteousness of Christ is imparted to us. We read that earlier. Do you need me to go back and look at that? Or do you remember that one? The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any worthiness or merit on our part, but, what's it say? From God is a precious thought. How can God do that? Do you know the Jewish people, even the ones that believed in Jesus, they, they really had a hard time with Paul. You know that. If you read Ephesians, Romans, Galatians, they really struggled with Paul. What do you mean they don't have to be circumcised? What do you mean they don't have to do this? They don't have to do that. They struggled because they were, they were raised with a legalistic mindset. Legalism does not mean obedience. Legalism means you get what you deserve. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, that righteousness is a free gift from God. He's not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power in our lives will be broken. How many people here would like Satan's power in your life to be broken? Amen. amen. I mean like, amen. amen. If you and I receive this truth that God gives you righteousness. Okay. Man. It's hard because it's like, there's so many quotes, and it's like wrapping your head around it, and I keep thinking, Lord, make this simple. I mean, I would like to be able to share this in, in 10 minutes, and it'd be so simple, but that takes the Spirit of God to do that. So I'm asking you, Father, pour your Spirit out now and help us to see this. This truth has to be clearly presented. Okay, this is an example. This is an example. We have a ministry that we've had since 2008. Small ministry, we, we operated out of a small little room. George has been there in our house. And let's say that we really would like, we have an opportunity to do some huge work, bigger than what we're already working on doing. You know, we've got a chance to order hundreds of thousands of books and Bibles to go to Kenya. We've got a chance to, to 
have another building added on outside. We've got a chance to whatever. And a man calls me on the phone and he says, Eric, he said, I know you haven't met me, but I've watched one of the videos you had on Secrets Unsealed or something. And I just want you to know, um, I know personally the owner of your bank. And I'm like, really? Well, my bank's in Asheville. He says, I know. He says, I live in California, but I, I know the owner. We go to meetings and stuff together. I'm friends with him. He said, I just want to let you know, I just called your bank and I put $500,000 in your account. Okay, we have, we have maybe $1,000 in our account right now. He tells me I put 500000 in there. And I go, you know, and I'm like, wow. You know, wow, that's really neat. Or he says a million. I put a million dollars. And I go, wow. Sir, I don't even know what to say. Thank you so much. You know, we get off the phone and I'm like, honey, <laughs> you're not going to believe the phone call I just got. This man who I've never met before in California just called me and said he deposited a million dollars in, in our ministry account because he saw the work that the Lord was doing. And I go, you know, bless that poor soul. <laughs> and I keep right on sending little $200 gifts to people in Kenya. And I'm sorry, I send an email. We don't have the money right now to send you know, a pallet of books. That would be $15,000. I don't have that right now. Do you know what's wrong? I don't believe the gift that he said he gave me. If I believed that that man really had deposited that money, do you know what I would do tomorrow? I would call Jan Marcuson. I would call uh, Harvest Time, you know, Heritage Books. I would have hundreds of thousands of books and Bibles, and they would be on a truck in two weeks. And I would, I would call every one of those little ministries, or I'd email every one of them and say, you know, I've been sending $200 each month. Guys, we're sending you $1,000 this month, or $10,000. I mean, if I believed, I would write the checks. God is saying, I've given you my righteousness. Why do you not believe me and write the checks? Do you understand? The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented for he knows that if you receive this, that the righteousness of Christ has been given to you as a gift, his power in your life will be broken. We talked about that. When Satan came to Jesus, he knew what God had said. You're my son. And 1 John 3 says, if you're a son, if you've been born of God, you cannot sin. Jesus is like, I believe that. Get thee behind me, Satan. And I go, man, we need to believe that. I need to believe that like Jesus did. And God goes, it's easy. Faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word. I have preferred thy word over my necessary food, Job said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. God said it. I live by that. If Satan can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience. How many people in here have experienced that? I have. Doubt and unbelief and darkness. If Satan can cause or can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of you and I who claim to be the children of God, then he can overcome us with temptation. Doubt. Doubting what? God's Word. And God's Word is light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. Doubt and unbelief and darkness. Satan always tries to put darkness between you and God's Word. Well, I know God said that, but that's not what he meant. That's exactly what he did with Eve. Hath God really said? Yes, he did. We have got to believe God's Word. Ellen White said that's how Christ overcame every temptation. She said the way he overcame was by the Word of God. He believed God's Word as we must believe. Amen. 
Now look at this one. Gospel Workers, page 103. That simple faith that takes God at His word should be encouraged. God's people must have that faith which will lay hold of divine power. I need a, a volunteer for a minute. Somebody stand up and read for me. I need somebody to read John 6.63 and somebody else to read 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Who would like to get John 6.63? Okay, when you get it, just stand up and, and tell us that. John 6.63. And then somebody else... After that, I need 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You get the next one. Please. Did you hear that? He did not say the words I speak unto you are spiritual. That's not what Jesus said. But that's how many people interpret it. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And we keep right on reading and we never even grasp it. Do you know something? When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When Jesus was talking to the disciples, he said, the words I'm speaking unto you, it's not me speaking them. It's the Father that's in me. The words he speaks are spirit and life. How do I get God's spirit? Through his word. It says there we need to lay hold of divine power. If you would read that one for me, ma'am. When God says something, we don't receive it as the word of a man. I can, tell, I can tell Brother Joseph, I'm coming to see you today. I'll be there at 4 o'clock. 6 o'clock, I'm still not there. And Joseph is on the phone trying to figure out where I am. I had every intention, but I didn't know they had a traffic jam that was backed up for 10 miles on the interstate. I couldn't do anything about that. God's word's not that way. There's nothing that can stop God's word from doing what it says. He says, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it as it is in truth. That word truth in Greek is unfailing verity. When my wife and I went through that divorce and my wife was fasting and praying and people at our church were telling her, Sarah, it's been two years. It's been three years. You need to just let go and move on with your life. He's living in adultery. You need to let go. My wife was like, God, you swore an oath to me that what you have joined together let no man put asunder. And that nice lady at the church said, Sarah, honey, the judge signed the papers. And my wife looked at her and said, ma'am, my God did not sign those papers. And she held on to Christ. And she said, I will not let you go except you do what you promised. Do you know that's what Jacob did in Genesis chapter 32? That's what you and I need to be doing now. I need my children saved. I need their hearts won. If you're praying for something, find where God promised it and put your hands on that promise and say, I will not let you go except you bless me. And I'm not, I'm not worthy. Jacob even said that in Genesis 32. I'm not worthy of the least of thy mercies nor of thy truth. But he was claiming the worthiness of Jesus, who is the word of God. The simple faith that takes God at His word should be encouraged. We must have that faith which will lay hold of divine power. Now look at this. This is Ephesians. For by... Read that to me. That whole verse. Okay, now look at this. I'm, I'm going to do something that it, it can be... A, it's a, a wrestling to grasp this. By grace are ye saved. That's Ephesians. Through faith. By, 
by grace are ye saved. We put that as future. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7, and I believe it's 1 Timothy 1, 9, says it's already done. And I'm going to read you a quote from Ellen White. She says the same thing. We can do nothing more to dishonor our Savior than by doubting He will save us. And I was like, how? That's easy to doubt that you're going to save us. Because He already did. But it only becomes yours as a reality by faith. Faith is not believing that God can do something or could do something. It's knowing that He already did. By grace. The word grace there in the Greek is 5485. It does include the definition of unmerited favor, but it also has a stronger definition. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection as is seen in the life. It's the power and spirit of God. By grace are ye, you could say ye are, saved through faith and that not of yourselves what's not of yourselves not the grace nor the salvation nor the faith it's all a gift of God those who believe that God for Christ's sake what's that word has that's past tense has forgiven their sins should not through temptation fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith your faith should... Guys, when I'm reading Ellen White's writings in the Bible, I do that. You put the, your name in there. Because otherwise you're reading about those people over there and them. It's got to be me. Ellen White says when God... All His Word, she says, is not merely written, but spoken to us individually. Those who believe that God, for Jesus' sake, has forgiven their sins should not through temptation fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith. Our faith should grow stronger until our Christian life, as well as our words, shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. That's not just forgiveness. It says in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Reckon ye also yourself therefore to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6. Yes. There is a delay in the coming of the bridegroom in order that all may have an opportunity to hear. What's that phrase? This is three angels. When we share the three angels, is there mercy? Or is there fear? You better or else. And I understand, there, there's a time and place, and you've got to ask the Lord in every circumstance, is this Nineveh, that they need to be scared, or is this where they need to know that God loves them? The first, second, the first and second angel's messages are all united and complete in the third. When you see dot, 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 that doesn't always mean I've left stuff out. Often that's just a pause so that you can think about what we just read. In these last days, it is our duty to ascertain the full meaning of the first, second, and third angel's messages. The whole gospel is to be proclaimed throughout the world. First, second, and third angel's message is, she says, is gospel. It's good news. Do you know the first angel's message? The judgment has come. Do you know the book of Acts? It tells us, God hath appointed a day in which he shall judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That doesn't mean that Christ is literally only sitting at the, at the judge. He's got the gavel. He's going to judge the world by Jesus. Here's what the pattern looks like. Do you look like him? It's not just Jesus up there going, 
you didn't get it right. Bam, you're out. That's not the kind of judgment. This is God saying, here's Eric's life. Here's the pattern. Jesus. Do you look like him? Well, if he's inside me, we will. The whole gospel is to be proclaimed throughout the world. Romans 1, 16 and 17. You remember, you know who this is a picture of, right? Pilgrim's Progress. If you guys haven't read that book, there's a, an excellent edition of it that was done by a Seventh-day Adventist. His name was Jim Pappas. Um, it's called The Amplified. And he did not change anything. He just, he made it just a little bit easier to read than the Old English. And there was a couple of spots in there where he added some of the truth that we know that John Bunyan didn't. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the glad tidings of Christ. Do you know what that means, ashamed? It means if I say, if I'm a little boy and I say my daddy's going to do something and my daddy doesn't do it, he put you to shame. Do you understand that? If I say God is going to do something, God says, He that believeth on me, I will not put you to shame. That lady at our church told my wife, you need to quit telling your children their daddy's coming home because what if he doesn't? And my wife said, if you don't believe, don't pray for me. I know in whom I believe. She said, I, I battled the devil with his doubts all night at home. I don't need to come here to church and hear your doubt." God said He would not put me to shame. And He also said He was able to do exceeding abundantly above all that my wife could ask or imagine. And He did. Because He didn't just bring me home, He brought me back to Him. He set me free. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So let's look at that word, salvation. That's the Hebrew and Greek definitions consolidated between all the, the Hebrew and Greek words for salvation. To rescue, to deliver, to set free, to heal, to restore and make whole again. If any man be in Christ Jesus, they are a new what? Creation. How did God create? He spoke. If any man or woman be in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. In Isaiah chapter 45 and Isaiah chapter 63, the Lord says, I that speak righteousness am mighty to save. It's dark, I speak light. It's filthy, I speak clean. It's broken, I speak whole. I don't do anything, I speak it and it's done. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Lost, like sheep. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. If you've got a sheep that's out there wandering around in the dark, that could be a child, it could be a spouse, it could be a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. The devil is coming to them telling them God doesn't really exist. Or he's telling them God hates you. Because if he really loved you, why did he let that terrible thing happen to you when you were a little girl or a little boy? God has abandoned you. You've gone too far. How many people have heard that before? You've gone too far. You've committed the unpardonable sin. There's no way that God will forgive you. You send me an email this weekend. Ellen White said we should never give thought to those words because they deny what Christ has said. She said when we speak doubt and we whisper what Satan is whispering in our, our mind or in our ears, she said, we say by our unbelief that there was not a sufficient offering made to avail in our case on Calvary. He paid for every human being that has ever lived. 
Ellen White says he felt the guilt of every human being that has ever lived. That means Marilyn Manson. That means Jeffrey Dahmer. That means Adolf Hitler. That means every kind of sick, twisted, perverted, upside down, all of them, if they would just believe and surrender, Jesus would take them to heaven. You think the two demoniacs? Those men were not naked and cutting themselves because they were thieves. They were perverts. There was no six months on probation and then you got to go to seminary and then I might let you teach Sabbath school. He fixed them instantly. Now look at this. I want to show you something. This was powerful. The next two slides are from Desire of Ages, page 233. The burden of Christ preaching was, quote, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Have you ever read in the book of Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 2, it says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. We always look and say that's the feet, right? That's the end of the world, right? No. In the days of these kings, who was ruling the, ru the world when Jesus showed up the first time? Rome. Who's ruling the world at the end of time? Rome. Jesus said, this is his words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Thus, the gospel message, this is Ellen White's words, thus the gospel message as given by the Savior himself was based on the prophecies. The time which he declared to be filled full was the period made known by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Now this is her quote. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression. The word thee there is supplied if you look it up in King James. To finish transgression. Do you know what transgression is in Hebrew? Sin means a side slip or habitual sinfulness. Transgression has two definitions in Hebrew. Apostasy and rebellion. To finish transgression and to make, what's that say? An end of sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 through 4 says he did that in his own flesh on the tree. To make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Most of our Adventist scholars up until maybe the last 10 years, when they, when they interpret this, most of the authors in our denomination, when they interpret that statement in Daniel 9, 24, where it says to anoint the most holy, they say that was Christ being anointed at his baptism. That is absolutely incorrect. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity. When did all those things take place? at Calvary to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The Bible says, and I even have two quotes from Ellen White. She said, when Christ ascended on high, he anointed the mercy seat with his own blood. Then he sprinkled his garments and he blessed his people. You asked me to send you the quote. I'll send it to you. Look at this one. First Selected Messages, page 394. These two pages, 394 and 395, I would recommend you read that. Write those down. They, they will bring tears to your eyes. Look what she says. 
Christ made an end of sin, bearing its heavy curse in his own body on the tree. And he hath taken away the curse of sin from all those who believe in him as a personal savior. That means you believe what, that God did what he said he did. He laid on Jesus the iniquities of us all. You believe that. It's that simple. Take God at his word. He makes an end of the controlling power of sin in the heart and the life and character of the believer testify. It bears witness to the genuine character of the divine influence upon the heart of Christ. Wow. This is a short statement that I have had written on a piece of paper and I, I read it almost every single day. Ellen White said, by becoming one with Christ, man is made free. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's freedom from drugs, if it's freedom from cigarettes, if it's freedom from bitterness, if it's freedom from lust, if it's freedom from appetite, if it's freedom from whatever. By becoming one with Christ, man is made free. Subjection to the will of Christ means restoration to perfect manhood. Do you know in the Bible it talks about God's voice being a still, small voice? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's Christ inside of you speaking through the Holy Spirit. And if we will listen to him, the more you listen when you hear his voice, the louder and the clearer his voice will become until you are like Enoch and you are talking to him and walking with him every moment of every day. But if I turn away my ear, and the devil does that. Oh, that's not God. That's just your imagination. Do you understand? He'll say, Eric, don't eat anymore. You've had enough today. And if I say, oh, one more bite won't hurt. The next time God speaks, it's quieter. It's not because God's not talking any louder. It's because I can't hear. Because I've chosen to yield to another. By becoming one with Christ, man is made free. So how do you become one with Christ? That's the question, isn't it? You believe God's Word. God's Word says you were made one with Christ on Calvary. Do you know that the Bible says in Romans, I believe it's in chapter 5, it says that in um, Adam all die, but in Christ all shall be made alive. Jesus paid for every human being that has ever lived. That's why everyone dies except for those that are translated. But if you believe in his resurrection, you rise from the grave. If you don't believe, he's already paid for your sins, but there's no resurrection. Hebrews chapter 3 says... For we are made partakers of Christ. That means you're joined. You're in union with Him. If you hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For with whom was God grieved for those 40 years? Was it not with them that continued in sin? It says with them that sinned. But when you look the word up, it means continued in. Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter into rest because of unbelief. Do you know God... God has told us that sin does not have dominion over us. But if we don't believe it, then we keep on sinning. And then if you say, well, I'm struggling to believe it, then that's what you need to focus your reading on. 
If you're struggling for victory over sin, don't focus necessarily on every other thing in the Bible. Focus where the injury is, where the wound is, where the help is needed most first. Look at this one. We cannot dishonor our Savior more than by doubting He will save us. That right there is the gospel by itself. Whatever may have been your life of transgression, however deep may be the stain of your sin, there is one who is able to save, rescue, deliver, set free, heal, and make whole. All to the uttermost, all that come unto God by Him. We honor our Lord and Master when we place implicit confidence in Him. If we distrust the message that He has sent, we shall be in a position similar to that of the Israelites who were bitten by the fiery serpents, but who would not look and live. She talked about King David, you know, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And she said the same thing. He had been bitten by the poisonous serpent. She said, there's only, one, there's only one answer to being bitten. Look and live. One of the things that I found is, Revelation chapter 12 says, the adversary, our adversary has been cast down, which accused us before our God day and night. It says we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb the accuser of our brethren, when Satan begins accusing you, and that's going to get more the closer we get, there's only one way to overcome. That's speak what God's Word says. If you have to speak it all day long, even under your breath, speak what God's Word said. I am redeemed. God has promised me He will never leave me nor forsake me. Jesus promised me that the... No man can come to me, Jesus said, except the Father which sent me draws him. And then he said, And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You speak God's word out loud. When you speak God's word, holy angels come and they fight the battle. When you speak the devil's affliction, evil angels come to try to make your situation worse. Titus chapter 3, verse 4. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. What's that say? He saves. Do you believe that? We have to believe that because God said so. 1 Timothy 1, 9 says the same thing. Somebody check me on that. Because sometimes I get 1st and 2nd Timothy, the two of those crossed up. I believe it's 1st Timothy 1.9. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. If I believe that, then I will walk in the freedom that He's promised. I will walk, you will walk in the victory that He's promised. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. By the, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. The word washing there is baptism. He saved us by the baptism of regeneration. Do you know that when Jesus came up out of the water at the Jordan River, Ellen White says that when he came up out of the water, John the Baptist is right there with him, Jesus bowed in an attitude of prayer. And then she said, He raised His eyes to heaven and raised His hands and He asked God if He would grant unto the entire human race power and light from the throne, from His throne to us. And do you know what she said God's answer was? Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. For me, I'm like, I don't get it. Yes, I know God was pleased with Jesus, but He certainly can't be pleased with me. 
Do you know what Ellen White says in the next statement? These words he was speaking to every believing soul. The Bible says there's one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That doesn't mean just one way to be baptized. It means Christ's baptism is yours. His anointing of the Holy Spirit was your anointing of the Holy Spirit. His baptism was the washing of your regeneration. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 2? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Y'all remember that? And the, the Jews said it took 40 and what, six years to build this, you know, to refurbish this temple, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? And Jesus said, but this he spake of the temple of his body. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 5 says, his body, we are members of his flesh and his bones. We are the temple that was raised when he was raised to walk in newness of life. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which He shed, which He gushed out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, being innocent, being clean by His grace, you should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. How can you be an heir if you're not even a member of the family? I mean, guys, heir comes to a child. Right? I know there's legal things that get around that nowadays, but that's not the way it was in the Old Testament. To be an heir, you had to be a son or a daughter. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again by the word of truth. Ephesians chapter 2 says, but God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when you, don't read we, because that puts everybody, even when you, put your name there, even when you were dead in sins, hath He quickened us together with Christ. He didn't wait for you to fix things. He said the only way they can be fixed is if I raise them to walk in newness of life. Even when we were dead in sins. And then the Apostle Paul writes, by grace you are saved. Not you will be, not you should be, you are. Do you believe God's Word? Then walk in it. And He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. I found, I should have brought it. I found a statement this past week that I'd printed off years ago. Ellen White says, Christ is in heaven representing us to God. We are here on the earth as Christ's representative of God's representative to the world. He is our representative there. We are His representative here. Mm -hmm. But that only happens if we become one by faith. So that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace, His divine influence, in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. Old Testament, they looked forward to the cross. New Testament, we look back in faith at what was accomplished. The cross is the center. She says, I present before you the great and grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. The foundation. 
John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. The word truth there, in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You shall know the truth. The word truth is unfailing verity of God's word. You shall know the unfailing verity of the word of God, and the truth shall make you free. Then they answered him. And this is a Seventh-day Adventist or Baptist or Methodist. Then they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever continues in sin is the slave of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever. But the son, if you've been born again, abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Do you know what I do? In my past, I look at that and go, man, I really need that. I wish that were mine. Jesus said, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yes. Let me show you something. Turn with me to Romans 6. I think this next one is our last slide. But I don't have all of it printed out, so I just want to show you a couple of verses here. We have to ask ourselves, do we believe this word which has been spoken from heaven? Do I believe God's word? Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Somebody read that for me out loud. Grace is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection as seen in the life. Sin shall not. In Greek, that sin does not have dominion over you. Do you know why the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, if you're dead, sin doesn't have dominion over a dead person anymore. Right? Colossians chapter 3 says, I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. So first example, Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And the natural human heart says, that's sometime in the future. But look at what the Apostle Paul was told to tell us. He says, sin does not have dominion over you. Look at, uh, look at verse 17 of Romans 6. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching, doctrine, which was delivered unto you. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you have become the servants of righteousness. Amen. Righteousness is Jesus. Yeah. This is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's two times in this one chapter he says we've already been made free. Then look at verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We don't need to look forward for God to do this. We need to believe what He's spoken and thank God which has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that goes in every circumstance. I need my marriage healed. I need my children and my relationship healed. I need physical healing. I need a demon cast out. I need deliverance from an addiction. I need deliverance from bitterness and resentment. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus, and I'm just paraphrasing, Jesus stood up to read and He opened the book of Isaiah. You remember the scroll? And He said, The Spirit of the Lord, of Yahweh, is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim glad tidings. Tidings, the gospel to the meek. To heal the brokenhearted. To set the captives free. To open the eyes of the, blame, of the blind. To make the lame to walk. All of it. It's all salvation. And Jesus is looking at you and I saying, 
I wish they would just believe. Read his word out loud. Speak his word out loud and claim it. And you will see the miracle. I know from personal experience. I know that. I know from what God did back years ago with my blood sugar. And that was only, who knows, nine, ten years ago. And it was funny because when that happened, <clears throat> I remember I went to this new doctor. Um, she was a nurse practitioner, but she, she was doctor for me. Um, and she was a Christian. And when I got there to see her, you know, first visit, and this was right after I told you earlier about me claiming those promises for healing, my first visit to see this new doctor. It was so funny. I got to back up just a little bit and we're going to end. On my previous doctor, a couple of weeks prior to that, I had went to the pharmacy to pick up my long-term insulin. I think it was called NPH or something back then. And I went to pick it up, and the uh, pharmacist said, Eric, I'm sorry, your, your prescription's run out. I was like, okay. I said, just call the doctor's office, and, and they can renew it right there on the phone. And he called the office, and the lady came back, and she said, I think you should talk to them. And it was one of the nurses at my doctor's office. And this is the other doctor before I went to this new one, the lady. And the, she said, Mr. Wilson, she said, I'm sorry, but Dr. So-and-so said he won't fill your prescription anymore. And I said, why? She said, because you missed your last appointment. And I was like, I always get a call, you know, like a reminder. I said, I'm sorry, you know, I'll make it up. She said, I, I said, ma'am, I said, I'm out of that insulin. I haven't been off that insulin for almost 30 years. I'm out of it. I have none. She said, Eric, I don't, I've never seen him act this way. She said, he won't fill it. So I walk out of the pharmacy and in my mind, I'm like, I mean, you can imagine. I've been on that insulin for almost 30 years. And in my mind, I was like, I could hear this voice that sounded like me saying, you're going to die. I mean, like, you're going to die. You can't go, you just can't stop taking insulin. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm like, because this was, God had just recently set me free, and I'm like, God, I, I need help, I need help, I don't know what to do. And I thought, you know, I'm going to call my wife, maybe she can get an appointment with her doctor. So I called my wife, and my wife, like, flipped out. This was not her day of having strong faith. She was like, what? You know, we got to do something. She said, let me call my doctor, I'll call you right back. She called me back like 20 minutes later, she said, here comes, she, she said she can't see you for two more weeks. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I said, uh, it's okay, I'm just going to pray. And I was like stressed. I was really stressed. And I pulled up to the red light in my, in my truck. And I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden I heard this still small voice. And God spoke to me and he said, Eric, you've been out of insulin for two days. You're not dead yet. And I was like, you're right, I'm not dead. And after a couple of more days of being off of it, I was like, I feel better now than I've ever felt. And then I was just taking the short-term insulin. And after a couple more months of claiming those promises, I was taking less than five units a day. And some days, there was a couple of days in that last little period, I was taking, I took zero, I ate three meals that day and took zero insulin and my sugar never went over 100. And when I went to this new doctor, my wife's physician or nurse practitioner, she came into the office, and, and she's very professional, but she's also a very good Christian. She came in and she had the folder, you know, with your name on it and all your charts and stuff, and she was like, so Mr. Wilson, how long have you been a diabetic? And I looked at her and I said, I'm not a diabetic. And she, she looked back and she opened that folder back up and she's looking and she said, I don't understand. And I looked at her and I said, because I was like, God, you know, I got to trust you. I don't care what people think of me. And I said, ma'am, I'm a son of God. I said, I have diabetes, but it's, it's an unwanted guest. And God is evicting it. And she looked at me and she got this huge smile. She said, you know, I have never had anybody tell me that before. 
she said, we'll go with it. So she did my labs, you know, hemoglobin A1C, all of that. She called me back a couple days later and she said, I need you to come in the office. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I need you to just come in the office. And in my mind, you know, I'm thinking, uh-oh, here we go, something bad. I get in the office and she said, Eric, I can't even classify you as type one. I got that when I was 13 or 14 years old. I said, what do you mean? She said, your, your hemoglobin A1C is so good. I can't classify this legally. I can't put down on a chart that you've got type one. And I said, what do I do? She said, we need to run another test. So she gave me this, and guys, I eat healthy. I like organic, I like healthy, vegan, no artificial flavors, no artificial colors. She gave me this glass full of this pink, Pepto-Bismol looking nuclear, I mean, it looked like it would glow in the dark. And you know what it is if you've ever had to do it. It's for a glucose test. It is like stocked full of just glucose. And then they had all kinds of junk that I don't even want. And I was like, Lord God, you know I would never eat this. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to trust you. Please forgive me. I drank it, and then you have to sit there. And they check your sugar every 30 minutes or whatever for a couple of hours. And she came back, and she was like, Eric, I, I've never seen this. She said, your sugar should have been over 500. She said, it only went up to like 200. She said, that's impossible. She said, I'm going to send you to a specialist. So she sent me to the specialist. He ran all these tests. He came back after a few weeks and he said, this is impossible. No one recovers from juvenile diabetes. He said, some people have what they call um, a honeymoon period. He said, that doesn't happen after 25, 30 years. He said, that happens in the first year or two, not after 25, 30 years. And just this week, the Lord brought that back to my memory. And he said, just like Peter, he said, at what point did you stop believing? Amen. We got to believe God's word. Lay your hand on the promise before you start praying for anything. Find where God promised the answer before you ask. Because if you have your hand on the promise, then you have a foundation for knowing you will receive what you've asked for. One more verse, Mark chapter 11, verse 24. If you can, turn there with me. Mark chapter 11, I believe it's verse 24. Actually, verse 20, 22. Everybody there? And Jesus answering them saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, Susan and John and Matthew and Joseph and Eric and Amy, verily I say unto you that Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, which God saith, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever God saith. Do you know it says that in Zechariah chapter 4? We shall say unto this mountain, Grace, grace unto it. And the mountain shall be removed. Verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, put your name there, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. I can believe that God will do it if God has promised it. Amen. Amen. Let's close. Dear Father in heaven, forgive us for doubting you. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. You know that we love you or we wouldn't be here today. Father, I pray that this evening and tomorrow and throughout this coming week and throughout the next however long it takes before you arrive. 
cause us every time that we open your word to hear your voice speaking personally and individually to us. We claim your life, Lord Jesus Christ, as ours. We claim your victory as ours. We claim your baptism as our baptism. We claim the anointing of thy Holy Spirit as our anointing, according to what you have promised in 1 John and 2 John. We claim your shed blood in Gethsemane. We claim your crucifixion, your shed blood on Calvary as ours. We claim your death unto sin as our death unto sin. We claim your burial as our burial, according to Romans 6. And Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, we claim thy glorious resurrection on that morning of the third day as our resurrection in thee to walk in newness of life. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for every gift you have already given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.